expectations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this is the feast of the baptism of our Lord. And it is rich with options in terms of the topic for the sermon. Uh, just in the gospel itself, we could be talking about baptism with the Holy Spirit, what that looks like. Uh, we could talk about the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. Why was it that Jesus needed to be baptized if the baptism of John was a baptism of repentance? Uh, we could talk about heaven being opened. Actually, the NIV is interesting on that. It says that the Father ripped open the heavens. Okay, what does that look like? What does that mean? And why is it necessary? Uh, we're going to be renewing our own baptismal covenant in this service today, so we could have talked about that. But as I was praying about all of this this week, the current circumstances demanded another message, and I believe that the Lord has given us a message in verse 7, where John the Baptist says, after me comes he who is mightier than I. Jesus is mighty. Jesus is the all-powerful one. The Greek word there for mighty or powerful is iskus, and it means to be able, to be capable, to be powerful. Now, what's interesting is power is a big concept in Koine Greek. There are actually nine different words that are translated into English as power in the Greek New Testament. The iskus that we have today is closely related to a word that most of us are pretty familiar with, actually, which is dunamis. And dunamis is where we get the word dynamite in English. So the, the implication is that there is this explosive power at work here. Now, why is that important for us in the current circumstances? Well, there are many powers at work in the world around us right now. We don't really think of them in terms of power most of the time. But for example, there is this little virus called a coronavirus. You can't see it with the naked eye. As a matter of fact, you can't really see it with just a standard microscope. It takes an electron microscope to actually look at it. It is so tiny and it's a virus. <clears throat> I checked to make sure this is true, but scientists say viruses are not actually living entities, that they're not really alive, but they act, they multiply when they are in a, an organic host like a human body. And so this tiny little thing is so powerful. We can't control it. We can't get rid of it. There's nothing we can do about this thing. It is so powerful. It has literally taken over the world. Okay, that's one power at work in the world around us. We saw evidence this week of political powers at work in the world and at odds with each other. And there are political strife. There is political strife all around the world right now. There are a lot of political powers at work social powers, social media is, is just pushing us to pay attention to this, that, or the other topic that's going on in the world right now. All of these powers are at work, among others, like the weather, like moving tectonic plates and so forth that are releasing power. There's a lot of stuff at work in the world right now. And the devil loves it. And the devil really, really loves it. And what he wants us to do is to keep our focus on all of these things at work in the world and to take our eyes off of Jesus. This morning when I got up, when I woke up, I was lying there in bed thinking about the sermon. And I was thinking, why bother? Nobody listens to the sermon anyway. Nobody pays any attention to the word of God. Why, why are you bothering to even preach a sermon today? Yeah, that was my wake up this morning. And so I immediately got up and I did the most important thing I've done all day. I made a pot of coffee. 
And then I sat down with the scriptures and I did the office of vigils. And what's interesting is the psalm, to, uh, one of these psalms appointed today for vigils was Psalm 25. When I got to verse 18, the Lord just kind of slapped me across the face and says, Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. God is so powerful. God is all powerful. Even my stupidity and my sins are completely under his control when I turn toward him. God brought me up a little bit short there. And it was kind of cool. It was a nice um, affirmation that I was actually hearing from the Lord because I was thinking about that. And the, the song that Jack sang uh, was from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, if we confess our sins and turn away from them, he is faithful. He will forgive us. Jesus is the Pantocrator, the all-powerful one. He is greater. He is mightier than the coronavirus, than the political strife, than the social unrest. He is more powerful than even our sins, and he can bring us into right relationship with the Father. He is the all-powerful one. Jesus is the all-powerful one. The scriptures tell us that even the weakness of God is greater than the strongest power arrayed against us. Let me look at this from two different perspectives. One is from the personal perspective. In Luke chapter 21, verse 36, Jesus is talking about the end times, uh, the apocalypse. And he says, but stay alert at all times, praying that you will have strength to escape all these things. That word strength is iskus. Be alert, praying that you will have power. You will have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Now that's relating to us individually, but then there's a corporate level to this too. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, when uh, Peter has just confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My church, there is no power made. That word prevail is iskus. My church, there is no power anywhere that can prevail against the body of Christ when the body of Christ is truly in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul reminds us that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is iskus, is stronger than men. You know, I was talking to uh, James before the service began about all the things that have been going on with him, his sister, his brother, his good friend, Jerry. Um, Jackie has her, her uh, family, uh, her, I guess it's your grandson-in-law. Would that be right? <laughs> okay. Uh, he's having all sorts of issues and problems. There are all these different things that have come against us. Uh, we've had Deb and, and uh, Sean overcoming the, the coronavirus. We've had, you know, other things that have come against us. And in all of these things, you kind of go, wow, you know, why is all this happening? Uh, and Paul reminds us when in 2 Corinthians that he even prayed three times to have the thorn in the flesh removed from him. And it didn't happen. And so what do we say about that? What, what is it that we can glean from that? Well, what Paul said was, that God spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you for, and here it is, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So even when we are feeling like the whole world has come against us and we are beaten down and we are weak and unable to do anything, if we turn to God, the one who is all-powerful, Jesus Christ, 
He has the power to make us perfect in our weakness. What seems weak in men, what seems weak in us, is powerful when it is in God's hands. Think about this. What is the most recognizable symbol of Christianity? It's the cross. Rome was the most powerful thing, the most powerful entity in that first century AD. They had basically conquered the entire known world. And in order to impose that power that they had, they used brutality. And one of the most brutal things that they could do was to punish criminals by nailing them to a cross outside the city gates so that everybody coming in and out of the city would see not only that the, these people were criminals, but they would see the power of Rome being made manifest in the justice that was being done at that time. But this was an instrument of death. The cross was an instrument of death. But in Christ, that instrument of death has turned to be for us the very sign of life. Because in Jesus Christ, that instrument of death became for us the sign that he has conquered death for all time and forever for everyone who turns to him. And so in that weakness... God's power is made perfect. We have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear from the powers in the world around us if we are in Christ. St. John in his first epistle, he says, I write to you young men because you are iskus, you are strong. Well, why are these young men strong? Because the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. They are in Christ. The young men are strong because they are in Christ Jesus. But now, seriously, be honest. Do we really want to be in Christ, or do we really want to be in control? I think the truth of the matter is most of us are really uncomfortable with somebody else being in control of our lives. We want to be in control. We don't want to be weak. We don't want to even look weak. But what did Jesus say in the Beatitudes? He said, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, how can we inherit the earth if we are meek and weak and lowly? Because we are in Christ. And in Christ, all power is made manifest. Think about the word meek. The word meek literally in the Greek word means to have a bit in your mouth. That's what the word meek means. And so if you have that bit in your mouth, if you are meek, then Christ can control where you go and what you do. That's what it means to be meek, is to be in the control of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we have nothing to fear if we are in Christ, if we let him control, him direct, and him guide us into what he would have us do. Even Jesus in the baptism story we heard today in the gospel that Deacon Mac read, he was baptized by John. Now, John is saying that he is the meek one. He is the weak one. After me comes he who is mightier than I. And so by Jesus being baptized by John, he is coming under the one who is supposedly the weaker one. What does that say? It looks as if he's submitting to the weakness of the world. He even, in Matthew's version of this gospel, John even um, objects and he says, no, 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 I should be baptized by you. But what does Jesus say in response to that? No, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. 
He did it because the father told him to do it. It was the right thing to do. It, it didn't look right. It didn't feel right. I mean, why would Jesus, who is without sin, submit to a baptism for repentance? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense on an earthly level. But in God, and by being meek and following the Father, Jesus did exactly what was supposed to be done, and he was made manifest in that moment. Will you, will I, will we do what God tells us to do? Will we, like Jesus, be submitted to the Heavenly Father and do the things that God is calling us to do, even if it looks crazy? Even if it makes us look weak? Even if it doesn't make any earthly sense to us whatsoever? We know that it is in that that the power of God can be made manifest in us. But it's very important for us to recognize, too, that this power is made manifest in the body of Christ. We cannot do this alone. We cannot be individual Christians. We are part of the body. One of the great temptations right now that I have been aware of in talking to various people throughout the, the kingdom is that there is a real temptation to isolate right now. I even had a conversation with a young man not too long ago who explained to me that he wasn't coming to church because he had to be apart. He had to be alone. He had to get this all figured out. I just kind of cocked my head and went, that doesn't work. You know, that really doesn't work. I just need some time to be alone. Well, it's not about you. I know you all have heard this before, I'm sure. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the kingdom. St. John, again, in his first epistle says, little children, and this is my translation of this particular verse, 1 John 4, 4. Little children, y'all are of God. See, I don't speak Greek, I speak Southern. Y'all are from God, okay? Little children, y'all are from God and have overcome the evil spirits at work in the world. For he who is in y'all is greater than he who is in the world. It's all in the plural. That's the point. It's not a word that is written for you as an individual. It's not that he who is in you as an individual is greater than he who is in the world. That is true if you are in Christ. But you've got to first be in y'all, in the body. For without being in the body, we are no longer connected. We are no longer in the flow of the spirit. We are no longer in the blood flow, as it were, of the sacrament. And so you are not walking in the power of God when you isolate yourself from the body. John chapter 17, uh, John shows us that Jesus prayed for you and me. Did you realize that? In that great high priestly prayer, he was praying for you, and he was praying for me. For in John chapter 17, verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these only, referring to his disciples. I do not pray for these disciples only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. That's you and me. I believe in Jesus Christ because there were faithful apostles who taught me about Jesus Christ through the word of God. I do not pray for these only, these disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. And what was the prayer? He prayed that they may all be one. And what would be the outcome if we truly are working in the power of God as one body? The world may believe that Jesus was sent from the Father. The world is dying to know the real power. We've seen all of the false powers. We have seen all of these evil powers at work. We have seen all of the, the, the um, K 
counterfeit powers that are at work in the world. But the world is dying to see the real power of God being made manifest in his body. And the only way that can happen is if we all may be one in Christ Jesus our Lord. We really do have nothing to fear if we are in Christ. For he is the all-powerful one. He is more powerful than a coronavirus. He is more powerful than any political power that is at work in the world. He is more powerful than anything that could come against us, either individually or as a church. Because Jesus himself said that the powers of this world will not prevail against his church. You know... It's really hard right now for everybody. I am personally having a very difficult time being priest of a virtual church. I hate preaching to my computer. I really do. It doesn't make me happy to see all of you in about this tiny little size, you know. I really would love to be able to pass the peace and hug each and every one of you. I really want to have things to be different. It's not easy right now, but if we stay in the word, if we stay in the sacraments, if we stay in the body, the power of God will be at work, and this too shall be overcome, and God will prevail in his church. The gates of hell stand no chance against the all-powerful God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.